You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Friday the 19th of October. Babyface thugs kick innocent man to death. Well-wishers stopped by police from visiting Taliban victim. Police give the race card a miss in house fire. Report from Nick Griffin, MEP, on fishing without appropriate PC permit. Mongolia removes statue of Lenin. Being straight, no longer normal, down under. Muslim severs girlfriend's tongue. Thought for the day, transparency, do we deserve it and do we get it? And finally, anyone for an NHS dose of camel's urine? UK News. From Scotland. Babyface thugs who kicked a labourer to death. Two Muslim thugs stamped, kicked and beat an innocent man to death because they wanted to and for no other reason, according to the court. A jury yesterday took two hours and 50 minutes to find fresh-faced Asif Rahman, 20, and Adel Ishak, 19, guilty of murdering Irish-born labourer William McKinney, 57. A charge that the attack was racially motivated was dropped. However, no other reason for the attack was given. William was coming home with a fish supper after a night out when Remen, known as Noddy, and Ishak, nicknamed Fetchy, attacked him outside his home in Pollock Shields, Glasgow, on January the 15th. His partner, Anne Newlands, 48, told how she saw two Asian men stamping on something. She went outside and found William on the ground. His last words, what's the problem, lads, were recorded on Ishak's phone. The killers, who blamed each other, had been drinking and taking diazepam. Both had convictions for assault and robbery and Remen was under a community payback order at the time of the murder. They both face mandatory life terms when eventually sentence is passed. A World Date spokesman commented, This was a racially motivated attack. They would not have done this to a fellow Muslim or Asian. Two well-wishers, posing as family, were stopped from seeing Malala Yousafzai, schoolgirl shot by the Taliban in hospital. Well-wishers? Nonsense. This is much, much more likely to have been an attempt at a hit by Taliban supporters. The visitors, one of whom claimed to be Malala's mother, were prevented from seeing the 14-year-old after turning up at Birmingham's Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Officers are guarding the site as Malala receives care under tight security conditions. She had been targeted by the Taliban because she was campaigning for better education for girls. The teenager who arrived in Britain yesterday and has not been accompanied by her family is not allowed to receive any visitors in hospital and police are ready to arrest anyone they believe is trying to see her. A World Date writer comments, Of course, put the poor girl in a Birmingham hospital surrounded by just about the highest rate per capita of Muslims to white indigenous in that area. Tests carried out on the remains of the Shakur house in Harlow suggest the blaze may have started accidentally. Maheen Shakur III, the last remaining child of the family, died last night at Broomfield Hospital. Her father is still in hospital. Although the early results suggest the blaze started in the lounge at the rear of the house and the police state that no accelerant such as petrol was used, they are refusing to rule out the possibility that it was an arson attack with racial overtones even stating that their house was deliberately attacked and have traced previous tenants in case it was they who were the intended targets. Further fanning of the flames is family friend Parvez Hamid, 43, who lives nearby, saying that a Ford Focus parked nearby was set alight at about the same time as the house fire, raised doubts in his mind that it could be accidental. A World Date spokesperson said, Talk about flogging a dead horse. This tragedy is probably completely above board. But of course, will the police question the father, who is the only survivor? Don't the authorities normally start with relatives, or is this just when they're white? Now I hand you over to Nick Griffin, MEP, for his report today, which deals with fishing without appropriate PC permits. So, the talk about the latest twists and turns in the Euro crisis that I prepared earlier will have to wait because the news is now all about the furious and predictably totalitarian reaction of the leftist elite to my Twitter defence of the rights of Christians and everybody else to decide who and who not 
to invite into their homes. Together with millions of other decent people, I was angered to hear the news yesterday that a vicious judge, one Claire Mulder, had snatched £3,600 from a quiet, unassuming Christian man and wife to hand it to two militant homosexual activists who, backed by the misnamed but extremely powerful left-wing lobbying group Liberty, had brought an action for discrimination after being told that unmarried couples of either sex could not sleep together in Mr and Mrs Wilkinson's bed and breakfast home in Berkshire. This is just the latest blow against freedom and justice in the long Marxist war against Christianity and traditional values in Britain. It has nothing to do with sexuality. As far as I and the British National Party are concerned, what consenting adults do in private is entirely their own affair. This is not about gay rights. It's about a terrible wrong, the threat to all of us, heterosexuals and homosexuals alike, posed by an overmighty state claiming ever more power over the common herd of taxpaying cattle. It's about a sinister, creeping totalitarianism by which the human rights of tiny but well-organised and noisy minorities are used by leftist judges to intimidate the silent majority, persecute and marginalise Christians and to whittle away our vanishing traditional freedoms. Most of all, the verdict effectively outlaws sincerely held Christian beliefs by outlawing the lifestyle choices that those beliefs impose on those who hold them. This is wrong, monstrously wrong, and it is dangerous because the atheistic left may think that the effective abolition of Christianity will create a rational atheistic society, but they are, as is so often the case, terribly mistaken. The abolition of Christianity in Britain would not create rational materialism. It would create a vacuum. And since nature abhors a vacuum, it would be filled by a fiercer, far less tolerant faith, Islam. Then the gay lobby really would have something to whine about because Muslim justice teams would stone all homosexuals to death. I could be most like most other MEPs, keep my head down and take the money. But I was elected by more than 132,000 members of the silent majority to give them a voice. So that's precisely what I do and intend to keep on doing. In an ideal world, we would all be allowed to discuss issues such as the left minority coalition assault on tradition rationally and politely. But the sad fact is that we are only allowed to appear in the mainstream media when they can in some way present our views and activities as reprehensible. Whether Muslim grooming gangs 10 years ago or the persecution and marginalisation of British Christianity today, we are forced either to stay silent or to be impolite and controversial. For me, like you, there's no choice. We must speak out for truth and justice. The only way through the intolerant iron curtain of controlled media silence is to throw the left liberals sprats as ground bait in order to catch the occasional mackerel. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. In terms of media access, this particular sprat netted us a whole full of big juicy fish, including slots on radios one, two, four and five, various local BBC radio stations and nearly all the TV news broadcasters as well. Even better, time after time, it emerged that the interviewers had no idea how to handle my arguments in favour of freedom, my criticism of the leftist war against Christianity and traditional values, or my acceptance that militant gays have as much right to discriminate against anyone else as believing Christians have to discriminate against them. On top of that, I got the chance to have a few pops at the Labour paedophile apologist Peter Tatchell and his revolting record of saying that sex with adults can bring nine-year-old children, quote, great joy, unquote. Good fishing indeed. The police who were banging on my door at midnight last night may well arrest me and prosecute me for fishing without the appropriate politically correct permit, but that's an occupational hazard as far as I'm concerned. I'm sure that you would have spotted the utter hypocrisy of the journalists who feign outrage over my having published part of the address of two men who'd gone out of the way to be offended in order to advance their cause and pocket a tidy sum into the bargain. Funny that not a single one of those journalists expressed anything other than glee when the full names and addresses of thousands of British National Party members, most of whom had never used their political beliefs to impinge on anyone else in any way, shape or form, were published on WikiLeaks. I would like to finish by appraising you of one last little known but highly pertinent fact. The persecution of the Christian B&B owners was funded and enabled by the so-called civil liberties lobby, Liberty, full name, the National Council for Civil Liberties. I was a member of the NCCL back in the early 1980s. 
When they discovered that a number of idealistic young nationalists had joined them, the oh-so-tolerant NCCL, Liberty, dropped the mask and showed how, to them, tolerance, democracy and equality are nothing more than verbal weapons of war. They don't actually believe in those things at all, because they promptly put a motion forward at their annual conference calling for our immediate expulsion, and while we as members had the right to attend the meeting, not one of us was permitted to say one word in our defence. We were expelled without even being allowed to ask why, let alone how such an action fitted in with their so-called principles. That's the left for you. Horrible, humourless, bigoted cowards. I'm so glad that you and me have made a different stuff to them. Till next time, remember, freedom isn't free, but the price is worth paying. Well, thank you, Nick. As usual, you put the world to rights in your own inimitable way. Thank you. World News Mongolia capital, Ulaanbaatar, removes Lenin statue. Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia, has removed its last bronze statue of Vladimir Lenin, denouncing the communist leader as a murderer. The monument was hoisted from its plinth in a park and dropped onto the back of a flatbed lorry at a ceremony attended by a city mayor, Bat ul Erden. During the Cold War, Mongolia was effectively a Soviet satellite state. Mr. Badul said that the statue would be auctioned off with a starting price of about $280, which is equivalent to £174 or €216. Euros. Australia, where being straight is no longer normal, students are taught. Students at 12 New South Wales high schools are being taught it is wrong and heterosexist to regard heterosexuality as the norm for human relationships. The Proud Schools pilot programme, implemented on 12 government schools in Sydney and the Hunter, is designed to stamp out homophobia, transphobia, which is fear of transsexuals, and heterosexism. Teachers are given professional development to learn to identify and stamp out any instances of heterosexist language in the playground, such as that's so gay, but at least 10 Liberal MPs are extremely concerned about the programme and will complain to Education Minister Adrian Piccoli this week. The programme defines heterosexism as the practice of positioning heterosexuality as the norm for human relationship, according to the Proud Schools consultation report. Also from Down Under, a man has been sentenced to eight and a half years jail for severing a woman's tongue. Mohammed Taslim Tahir was in a relationship with Catherine Skinner in Adelaide and when she moved to the Gold Coast, he followed her. The Southport District Court heard in November 2010 the then 21-year-old attacked Miss Skinner in her apartment. The Crown Prosecutor told the court Tahir smashed an empty bottle over the 20-year-old's head several times, fracturing her eye socket. Tahir then dragged a knife across her face, cutting her mouth and severing her tongue, the court heard. Judge Catherine McGuinness sentenced Tahir to eight and a half years jail. She ordered he be eligible for parole after serving a third of his sentence. A woman in the public gallery gasped when the judge explained that, due to time already served, Tahir could be released in September next year. A World Date reporter comments, Is Australia taking lessons in justice from the UK? Thought for the day. Transparency. Do we get it? And do we deserve it? Do we, the British people, get transparency from those in power? Whilst we, as the British National Party, give total transparency in our dealings to our members and activists, do other political parties and similar organisations do the same? I find that people who yell the most about transparency have the most to hide and rarely exhibit the trait themselves in their dealings. Take the government. Can they really be so thick or ignorant to ignore the many and various disasters that massive immigration has brought to this country? Do they give us, the people, regardless of our political leanings, the true and transparent picture of what is happening? No, they do not. In fact, both Camoran and Millipede seem to both be scrabbling around some idiot who called a policeman a pleb in a fit of rage and has had to apologise to the thought police for it. Apparently the word pleb is a swear word. Well, you learn something every day, don't you? From the mouths of so-called well-educated men, actually, pleb is a shortening of the Latin word plebeius, which means common or low, 
or plebicola, friend of the people. Not a swear word at all. In fact, the word plebiscite means word of the people and is commonly used in our judiciary system. So where is the taking of God's name in vain here? He wasn't swearing. He was stating a fact that the policeman is an officer of the law and the people. Who do they put in Parliament these days? Transparency works both ways, as our laws are supposed to. No one, least of all me, minds laws. I'm a fan of laws. You need laws in a civilised society. Without laws and the means to administer them, everyone is lost. But they should apply to everyone in the land. Not a select few who are unpopular in the current ridiculous Marxist, liberal, multi-ethnic climate in the UK. Take this very odd furor over the under-21 so-called British footy team playing in Serbia. What the media and some idiots do not want to acknowledge is that elsewhere in Europe and the world in general, not everyone is over the moon at viewing black, Asian and rainbow colours playing for one European country. Many people actually dislike seeing people from other cultures all the time being pushed in their faces. The Serbians have my vote. They do not like black players and showed it. It comes under freedom of speech and thought. The Muslims shout and yell at practically everything and yet seem to get away, literally, in some cases, with murder. And yet, poor old Serbia, already groaning under a pro-Islamic rebuilding of the Ottoman Empire and its own country, as indeed most of us are, stand to get fined by the FA for objecting to whom plays in what team in their land. What nonsense. In fact, Spain, the UK, France and Russia have all been fined for racist abuse. So we're not alone, are we? But they are being totally transparent, aren't they? Total transparency has a lovely ring to it. But who wants the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Not many people in the UK or in the establishment, or else the British National Party would not only be welcomed in every home, but in Parliament as well. Plebs and sheeples do not want the truth. They do not appreciate total transparency, as we in our party have proved. The total transparent truth is that massive immigration has had the same effect on the existing population as total transparency has on the media. They run from it or form alternative truths to accommodate their fears. It is massive unchecked immigration into this country that has changed us from a laid-back industrious nation to a nation of lazy, greedy, self-seeking and ignorant plebeian peoples. And I mean this in the best possible taste. I will quote from a book I'm reading, which is an up-to-date crime novel and non-political. I quote, He harboured a burning anger at the way his country had been sold down the river by politicians who had opened the floodgates to millions of immigrants, who had watered down their once great culture to such an extent that it no longer even existed, who had helped create a soft, fat people whose poor were more interested in claiming benefits and watching reality TV than in doing anything to stop the rot all around them. End of quote. We are helped in this by successive governments, council authorities, schools, universities, all the media and press, and in fact anyone who is a minor anything has been tutored in diversity, the Frankfurt School and the School of Common Purpose, all with a hefty dose of anti-anything formerly thought of as normal, for example, marriage to a person of the opposite sex, not the same sex. Now I have been accused of being homophobic, but I am not. I really do not care who does what to whom, or how many, but I do personally resent turning on my TV and seeing two blokes with their tongues down each other's throats or wheeling half-caste children around, or worse. It may go on, it may be on the increase, thanks to the anti-male and pro-female propaganda, but I do not want to have it shoved in my face literally all the time. Neither should homosexuality be subject on the youngster's school curriculum. Let them find out the good old-fashioned way, mate. Now, back to transparency. If people do not have transparency given to them, the people are allowed to air their feelings on what is happening in their country. If the police stop pushing the race car to the limit against white people and against anyone who simply has old-fashioned standards and exhibited transparency in their dealings with the Muslims especially, who seem to be off limits as far as British laws are concerned, then we would all be happier. If a government said to the people, we have made an awful mistake in allowing so many immigrants in, we need your help and understanding whilst this problem is sorted, we would all be a happier nation. 
If the church stood up for itself and condemned the spread of Islam, we would all be a happier people. If we had a referendum about the EU, we would all be a happier people as well. Get the drift? Total transparency works both ways. You give it and you get it. You do not and you will not receive it. Fact of life, my friends. When all you get is bias, misinformation, bigotry and ignorance, that is what will prevail. And finally, will Sharia camel urine cure be fully covered by the National Health Service in the UK? Sharia medicine. Egyptian clinic treats people with camel urine. Several Islamic authorities praise the practice of drinking camel urine for good health, based on the advice of the Muslim prophet Muhammad. In Egypt, there is now even a clinic that treats people by giving them camel urine to drink. Several women are shown drinking camel urine, and doing all they can to keep it down and not vomit. A video appeared on Dream TV with talk show host Wael Ibrashi narrating. It shows men collecting camel urine in buckets and giving it to people who are, in Ibrashi's words, looking to be healed from influenza, diabetes, infectious diseases, infertility, etc. etc. Ibrashi concluded by saying he is not airing this video to mock or disgust, but to determine whether we are moving forward or whether we are moving backwards. Hmm. Indeed, the growing popularity of drinking camel urine is the latest example of the true nature of the Arab Spring. Or is it the Camel Spring? Mm. You have been listening to The World of Date. I am Lynn Mozart, and I and the team at World of Date and Radio Britain wish you all a very happy and safe weekend. And keep the camel urine bottled, please. Good night. <laughs>